So we got five imperatives to cover. A few people have asked, what does that even mean? It's just like, there are so many things that are changing and there are some things that matter and some things that don't as much. But through all the noise, there are some big trends and things you've got to get on top of this year. And if you don't, efficiency, scale, health of business gets impacted. So we brought together what we call the giants of e-com, three businesses that you probably can't go a day not hearing about if you're on LinkedIn or going to a, a conference or chatting with people who are happy with their business. Uh, we got Gorgeous, we got Yapo, and ourselves, Agile. Um, <clears throat> introduce myself real quick. My name is Nick Rajpal, VP of Strategy uh, at Agile. I just finished 16 years here. Uh, I was brought in to mm -hmm. convert our business from a project-based business to a marketing solutions business, launching all of our marketing solutions, SEO, Google Ads, Bing Ads, conversion test, email marketing, and Amazon, building out those teams and our workflows and our technology. Uh, for the first half of my tenure here, and in the last one year, I've been working on holistic marketing sciences with uh, a strategy department. I'm also the host of the webinar series and just crossed about 420 of those webinars thanks to some quick calculations from some of our audience members a few weeks ago. Great. Danielle, you are up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi guys, I am Danielle Butera, partner manager here at Yapo. Um, I also help run our managed services program. If you haven't heard of our managed services program, it trains and enables agencies to deliver best in class email and SMS services to their clients. So I help run that on top of my normal partner manager duties. Um, and if you haven't heard of Yapo, you have probably, like Nick said, seen us on LinkedIn with our frown campaign recently. Um, but we are a retention marketing platform. We offer reviews, loyalty, referrals, subscriptions, email, and SMS solutions. I know that is a mouthful. Um, that help brands really just maximize customer value, help turn one-time shoppers into customers for real long. Keep it short and sweet for you. Rohan, you're up. Fantastic. Great to see everybody on this webinar. My name is Rohan. I'm based in Toronto, Canada. So great to see some Canadians in the chat. Uh, I'm over here at Gorgeous. I've been at Gorgeous since 2020. So just coming up on my four year mark, actually, this June. Uh, it's been incredible to work for uh, a company like Gorgeous and seeing the growth and scale from from our perspective. And the best part about it is we get to work with, uh, number one, some incredible brands, but also some very incredible partners in the space like Agital. Uh, over my time here, over the last four years, I've worked with a wide variety of partners, some of our VC and FinTech partners, our platform partners in, in Shopify and BigCommerce. Uh, and now I manage some of our most key agency relationships and work really closely with Nick and the Agital team uh, to really help support merchants on the customer support side of things uh, with respect to help desk operations, as well as automation. And with that, a quick overview of Gorgeous, we are a help desk built for e-commerce. We consolidate all of your different channels into one platform. So email, chat, phone, SMS, social media. We integrate with the platform that you're using over hundred of the most commonly used apps in the space to make sure that you're super efficient from a customer support standpoint, building in automation features uh, optimally as possible. Uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, making sure that your customers are happy. And with that, we're going to move into the first topic of today, which is uh, a really exciting one and a topic that, of course, everybody's talking about, which is uh, when and how to use AI. So I want to start by kind of giving a little bit of a lay of the land here uh, with respect to why it's so important to utilize uh, AI today in, in the 2020s. So let's just rewind a little bit back to the 2000s. Um, everybody was moving to the internet. It was so important that companies started to become digitally native um, because that's what everybody was doing. That's where the business was. And that's how shoppers wanted to shop. Uh, and now in the 2020s, it's all about artificial intelligence, right? Um, and the whole point here is that it's important to focus on these topics, because if you don't focus on a topic like artificial intelligence, you're going to get lost in the dust a little bit compared to competitors in the space. And if we take a look at an example uh, that everybody knows really, really well, Blockbuster, of course, too. In 2000, super imperative to become digitally native, um, and they really missed the mark with respect to doing so. 
And of course, what they did is they got Netflix out. You know, Netflix was the company to go become digitally native, read the room with respect to how customers are interacting with their brand. Uh, and they took over the market share with respect to, you know, Blockbuster having it in the past before 2000. Uh, and now today, in that same vein, it's super important that brands become digitally AI native uh, so that they are being efficient as possible with respect to their customers, with respect to their partners, um, and ultimately keeping everybody happy. And if we take an example with respect to customer support, just because that's what Gorgeous does, AI right now is fueling the shift of over $100 billion in customer support, human labor spend software to software by 2030. So obviously incredible numbers there. And if we flip to the next slide, um, I do want to highlight a little bit how Gorgeous is, is working with respect to AI. At Gorgeous, we're very honest about the fact that we see AI as a complement to human-focused agents on your customer support side. Uh, we think the human touch is essential for exceptional customer success. We've tested that generative AI approach and sometimes in some cases found it to be unreliable. So at Gorgeous, we're thinking about how can we optimize the use of AI for you with respect to your customers so that customers are getting the answers they need in a very quick fashion, but they're also getting the right answers. They're getting resolutions to their problems. They're not having to spend time to go through an automation flow, through an AI flow, and then still have to end up interacting with a human or go find the answer themselves. Uh, some tools out there will end up promising. Uh, you know, automating a huge percentage of your tickets, no matter where they're coming from, and think that AI can handle every single piece that there is to handle. Uh, right now, we're very honest about that. Use AI in conjunction with your human-focused human agents. You can do so in an effective manner, so it doesn't, so you potentially could uh, prohibit the need to have to go out and hire new customer support agents by putting automation into place. But the important piece is you find that right threshold for you and your brand. It could be 30%, it could be 40%, it could be 50%, depending on your brand and what you sell and how you interact with your customers. But that's how we're thinking about things at Gorgeous. And if we take a look at um, our roadmap, AI is, is going to continue to iterate. Um, over the course of 2024, it's going to continue to get bigger and better. AI with respect to customer support and interacting with your customers uh, it's going to start to learn your brand voice, understand how you uh, on the human side like to interact with your customers, uh, how you like to respond to them, get back to them on their issues. And AI over the course of 2024 might take you from 30% automation all the way through to 60% automation. Uh, right now at Gorgeous, we utilize AI in a variety of different ways through our automation suite. Number one is through article recommendations. So if customers ask a question about, you know, for example, a loyalty program or what is your shipping policy or what are your products made out of? We utilize AI on the chatbot side to be able to find those answers instantaneously to get back to customers in a very, very short period of time, instantaneously, so that they have the answer that they need. They're able to carry on with their day, with their shopping experience on your website, and they don't have to spend time digging around for that answer or interacting with a human, which obviously takes time and leaves room for manual human error. Over the course of this year, train my AI. So being able to review AI interactions to fill gaps in your knowledge base, provide feedback, improve those AI conversations. We've released an AI generated help center. So AI studies your help desk interactions with your customers to generate a help center with your policies, with your most frequently asked questions, uh, which ends up as a result, increasing the number of topics or inquiries that AI is able to answer. Right now, we've rolled out in open beta an AI agent. So when customers do ask a question, AI can generate an answer based on information that you have in your knowledge base, based on your brand voice, which you can end up selecting. Do you want it to be professional? Do you want it to be uh, friendly? Do you want it to be something else? And then can you, you can perform the relevant actions as a result of that. And then finally, an interaction quality score. So grading every AI interaction based on the helpfulness, based on the customer tone to help you then monitor the performance of the AI pieces that you have in place to help you understand as a brand, are you putting too much AI or automation in place? Are you putting not enough in place? Could you probably fill some gaps utilizing automation and AI? And that's how we see things on the customer support side of things. Putting that right piece in place to make sure that you're not overstepping that threshold and that customers are happy with the responses that they're getting uh, and able to shop around uh, you know, with a happy experience at the end of the day. And before I pass things off, I want to put in a quick poll here. Um, just to understand in the room, I know we have e-commerce brands listening in today. I would love to understand how many tickets are you currently automating on average when it comes to customer support through all of your different channels? Is it fewer than 10? Is it between 10 and 30? Is it 30 and 50 or over 50% of tickets?
Okay, the answers are coming in pretty quickly. Um, why don't we close this out in five, four, three, two, one. What do you think about those results, Roland? Okay, really interesting. Um, fewer than 10. I uh, Right now at Gorgeous, we have a, a initiative in place when new brands going to join Gorgeous on the customer support side of things to automate 30% of tickets for you within 30 days. And so it's really interesting to see that uh, most people in the room actually automate fewer than 10% of tickets. I can tell you right now, we can probably help from that standpoint, just given the fact that in e-commerce, there's so many common repetitive questions. Where's my order? What's my shipping status? When is it going to arrive that you can fully put automation into place with? Uh, so I would love to talk to the 18 of you in that category for the four of you in the 10 to 30 category to help you put better automation pieces into place. You can be a lot more efficient. And as a result, you can drive a ton more revenue out of customer support. Awesome. Thank you. Um, really cool to hear what Gorgeous is doing with AI, especially because I think it echoes a lot of what Yapo is working on. Um, we're doing a lot with AI in a really cool and strategic way because I think it's a really big buzzword. So I'm excited to share with you um, one feature in particular um, that I think in general, shoppers and, and people just want information faster than ever before. Um, and it's our job as marketers to really just deliver on that, but also in a trustworthy way, especially when it comes to building brand credibility as a reviews provider. Um, so our, we have a new AI powered tool that's uh, our review responses with AI. So what it'll do is scan all of the reviews for a specific product and simplify them into bite-sized summaries to help shoppers just focus on the most critical information that's going to get them to make a smarter purchase faster. So really some of the key benefits of this is going to be to boost brand credibility, um, showcasing concise and insightful summaries customer feedback, and really just foster trust among potential buyers, um, and also just driving efficiency and content consumption. So being able to accelerate that shopper journey by reducing review analysis time, having to sift through all of those reviews, maybe to figure out, you know, am I going to want to make this purchase or not, um, which is really just going to lead to improved engagement and conversions. And this is just one of the many ways that we are leveraging AI here at Yapo. We actually launched a new tool in Q3 of last year called Taylor. And what Taylor does is she sits across our entire retention platform and helps just really digest information faster um, and make help marketers make informed marketing decisions throughout SMS email and analytics. So whether it's um, helping respond to uh, negative or positive reviews, whether it's creating SMS and email content, or just being able to create segments for SMS and email communication faster, uh, all ways that tailors just um, a really cool and strategic way that we're leveraging AI here. Awesome. A um, few thoughts on AI from the agile side um, in our marketing campaigns that we, we do for clients. We've been testing um, generative AI as well as machine learning. From the generative AI side, uh, working to to have ChatGPT. If you've ever like written an email and you ask ChatGPT to like spruce it up or make it more interesting, I've been trying the same type of thing with meta descriptions to make it more enticing. And it's nice to see how ChatGPT thinks, uh, what the output is, especially how streamlined it is, uh, with a click through rate increase of nineteen percent for one of our clients uh, focused on. Uh, baby landscaping. Uh, B2C e-com site uh, is one of many tests that we've done for content at the product page level uh, and at the category page level. But writing content for a product page, so there's enough substantial content for Google to sink their teeth into. It's unique. It's ontologically on point. Um, is something that AI can do with the right prompts. Um, what we've seen is there's kind of a give and take um, for long form. You get um, a really nice growth in query visibility. There's more keywords you're showing up for than if you had short form because there's more keywords in the density of the content. But shorter content in general is being rewarded better with significantly higher impressions. Either way, with uh, while all the work that we did for this client 
increased pages without unique content by 37%. It's the AI unique content that grew 189% uh, overall. So really nice. But again, it's all about quality control prompts. You have to be uh, using your discernment and intervention and planning to support AI. It will support you as well. Overall, Google doesn't um, want to reject AI. They want great quality content. They're not really going to penalize you for how you uh, accomplish that. They want you to create a better internet for them, and they want to create uh, access to content that is more ontologically on point. So if you're thinking through how to use AI in some of the things that you work on, uh, at Agile, we always break up our strategies across five desired outcomes, awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty, and advocacy. And then we we plan out for every channel, how are all the channels gonna work together for awareness, for consideration, et cetera. So with SEO, AI, um, what you can do on the awareness side is create content for, especially if your brand doesn't have a lot of categorical search, but people just search for the problems, create more content in the upper, upper funnel, the awareness side. Before someone says, I know the category I want to buy from. For consideration, while you still want to write content around your core category, you may want to get um, some depth to your category pages like FAQs and AI chatbots built in to support at those important pages. Category pages are the lifeblood of e -com. For conversion, you can use AI to develop some insights on improving conversion rate. You can develop product content. You can create lifestyle images um, from AI uh, gen. And then on the loyalty side, you can also quickly write responses for reviews that your customers can easily approve. Now, AI is also built into a multitude of systems in Google Ads and Meta Ads, et cetera. We'll focus on the Google Ads side real quick. So in Performance Max in Google, if you have not already started to use these tools, uh, if your agency is not using these tools, Performance Max requires that you create lots and lots of assets. Those are images and videos. So they give you a tool to build them from scratch very easily. But you have to use them. Um, with purpose. So you, you drill into your performance max campaigns and get to the AI generator and start building things out. Um, the AI is pretty clever. It's not perfect. If you ask for dog running on a beach, there's your dog. It might only have three legs, nothing against tripod dogs, but if you didn't intend on having a tripod, um, that's what you, you're gonna get. Dog driving your car, Car has no logo, it's perfect. It kind of fits exactly what you'd want. Superhero dog with cape um, has a scar on one of its eyes. Um, there are these, these things uh, with symmetry that are kind of tricky and even creating the, the correct number of, of um, uh, fingers on the paw is something that AI consistently gets wrong. But the more creative you are with things, typically the better it gets like dog takes over the universe. That's where AI shines. They have lots of options and they do it in a genius way that you really want to use in your ads. So to continue on to our second imperative and we're, we're a, little, a little behind on time. We're going to catch up a little bit. AI was a big topic for us. Talk about stack integrations. So technologies are trying to work well together. You've got three different businesses chatting it up on a webinar right now, we're all trying to help our clients in more seamless ways. It is this kind of concept where it's time to be more cooperative across as many technologies and channels as possible that helped us adopt our framework at Agile, which is stop talking to me about Google Ads and Meta and Amazon. Let's talk about the desired outcomes of our marketing. I want cold awareness targeting, I want to show up when people search for my category. That's consideration. I want to convince past visitors to buy. 
That's conversion. I want to create a machine getting my past customers to buy again. That's loyalty. And I'm going to take a hit on some of my ad dollars asking for likes and shares and reviews. That's advocacy. Why take the hit? Because when that activity fires off, it creates activity and awareness and conversion. You get a virtuous cycle of these different activities, which is why we call it the virtuous activity cycle, the VAC. In these different nexus points, you have technologies that understand that's how they're supposed to work together. So you take a technology like Clavio or any ESP that is building read rights with ads platforms, and all of a sudden, you've got a way to bring your awareness, your conversion, and your loyalty strategies together. So for awareness, you can have meta ads, Google ads, TikTok ads, Critio ads that take um, a viewer's consent to add them into your Clavio list. It's cold awareness targeting turns right into your list. You can then use that list to push back out to Meta and Google and TikTok and Critio and Pinterest to nurture them to their first sale, then use the data from their first sale to encourage them to repeat sale after that. The read-write flows have been established now. For consideration, this is non-branded search. Technologies like PackView make it easy to take all the keyword data from Amazon, from Walmart, from Target, and then studying your competitors, combine that together into a composite, and all of a sudden, you have all this data from a multitude of channels that are teaching your strategy back and forth and measuring to make sure your search presence gets stronger and stronger and stronger and consistent. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'll change this over. Uh, so this is always an exciting and fun topic for me because uh, an integrated or consolidated tech stack is kind of the name of the game for Yapo and it's something we've been early adopters of, um, especially over the last 10 years. Obviously, we started as a reviews platform, but now have, again, loyalty subscriptions, email, SMS, all of these different um, offerings and the synergies between them is really our strong point uh, into becoming this full service retention marketing platform. So I'm going to ask everybody for a little bit of engagement. If you guys can all put in the chat, um, if you're a brand, this is easy. If you're an agency um, or anybody else that, that might be on the tech or partner side that's in here today, um, just think about the brands you work with. Um, but if you can put in the chat how many single point solutions you're currently using, uh, whether it's services that Yapo offers or otherwise, I'd love to see some of those numbers just kind of trickle in while I talk here. But um, even if you've been on a demo with Yapo recently, uh, you've heard us preach about kind of the growth at all costs era that came over COVID in 2020 um, is over. And brands kind of executing the same, <laughs> are too many, sorry. Uh, brands executing the same marketing strategies that they were in 2020 aren't really setting themselves up for long-term sustainable success. Um, brands are definitely spending more on acquisition um, for the ones that are definitely continuing to gain less and that bucket's leaking. We call it the leaky bucket syndrome. For example, uh, e-commerce industry right now, the repeat purchase rate is stagnant at 29%. So I keep going like this because it's like a, a flat line. Um, and which makes it even more worrisome is that the number of orders or products purchased from those repeat customers is decreasing at about 25%. So essentially what this all means is that without brands taking action to fix revenue growth, uh, profitability is just further out of reach. So however, I promise I'm not gonna be Debbie Downer on this webinar today, Yapo really has understood the challenges of the market and made it our whole mission to give brands the tools and guidance to really retain customers. So brands leveraging Yapo for their retention marketing strategy really have seen the impact on their path to profitability and have seen a 40% increase in repeat customer rate uh, and a 25% increase in sales from repeat customers. Um, but uh, we don't um, really just stop at or I should say our data consolidation efforts don't just stop at our own product synergies between 
what we can do under our roof. Um, we have over a hundred tech integrations within the ecosystem. So we make it really easy for brands to also integrate Yapo with your current tech stack. Um, we also have a lot of more integrations on the horizon. So brands really do have the flexibility and power to get a single view of their customer, acquire new customers, um, optimize automated communication, really evaluate performance with the tools that they already know and love. Um, one specific integration that we launched towards the end of last year that I wanted to call out today, Nick was just talking about TikTok as well, uh, is our integration on the review side with TikTok Shot. So humble brag, we are the first and only reviews provider to be able to syndicate reviews out to TikTok Shot, um, which really just allows customers to get the information and trust that they need when they're making purchases on TikTok. So one that we're really excited about and just one great example of some of our uh, tech integrations. But to get into another exciting example of some of our tech integrations in the space, uh, we do have an amazing integration with Gorgeous that I will actually let Ryan speak to. Amazing, thank you, Danielle. And uh, yeah, as Danielle alluded to, Gorgeous and Yapo have worked extremely closely over the last several years. Uh, and for that reason, it's super important for us to have a really strong integration with with Yapo. Obviously, Yapo is, is quite multifaceted at this point, which is amazing to see. But um, as a broader theme here, you know, Danielle mentioned Yapo integrates with over 100. We also integrate on the gorgeous side with over 100 of the most commonly used apps in the DDC space. So while integrating with your platform on the customer support side of things is super important for those data pieces, having a full 360 view of your customer within one platform makes for things uh, to be handled smoothly and efficiently with respect to getting back to your customers, understanding the sentiment of your customers uh, and making sure they come back for more. Uh, and if we take a look at this use case with, with Gorgeous and Yapo, we'll take a couple of examples on a few of their products that, they, that we currently have. Uh, number one, you can display Yapo's data in Gorgeous uh, in the activity sidebar in that customer view, things like loyalty points, provided ratings, the latest reviews, you can also manage customer loyalty plans, and that means you can change the point balance. You can assign somebody to be a VIP. You can honor redemptions there. You can send rewards directly from within the Gorgeous sidebar. You can respond to a question with an answer either publicly or privately um, as new tickets based on those ratings. You can moderate customer reviews on the product and the site and questions directly from within Gorgeous within that ticket view. And you can also request reviews from a customer. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Danielle spoke to Yatpo's uh, uh, reviews product. Obviously, Yatpo does uh, a considerable number of actions across the DDC space today. But this is a, a zoomed in look at why it's so important to have really, really strong tech integrations with respect to whatever solution that you may be using out there. And with respect to Gorgeous as well, um, it's also important to keep a consolidated view of all of your different channels, right? We integrate with, as I said, over 100 of the most commonly used apps, but we also bring in all of your different channels like email, chat, phone, SMS, social media. We bring in Instagram and Facebook ad comments, Messenger, DMs. We also, to Danielle's point as well, also integrate with TikTok Shop. So there's a number of different ways that you can communicate with your customer, gain value and information from them through all of the different apps that you're utilizing internally in addition to your platform to understand how you can help that customer or get back to that customer with the most accurate pieces of information possible uh, so that they're getting a quick answer, they're getting an accurate answer. And really what that does is it allows the customer to maintain loyalty to you as a brand, right? If you provide them with a really good experience based on data that you already have at your fingertips within one single view, that customer is gonna feel much more appreciated. Uh, they're gonna keep coming back for more if they're an already existing customer. And if you create that really good first experience for them when they first visit your website, um, then they're going to turn into a net new shopper for you, opportunity for you to, to kind of land and expand on that customer as well too, uh, to turn them into a higher AOV client as well. Did I hear net new customer? All right. Our next section is be assertive with net new customers. Um, and for each of these sections, we wanted to kind of tell you why. Um, obviously, you've got to be assertive with net new customers. So why now? There's the deal. There's a lot of black box technologies out there right now, Google Performance Max being one of them. While we love the technology when used correctly, which means not the way Google tells you to do it, but totally different, uh, significantly more granularity, better use of zombie scripts, more assertive on signals, but also Performance Max 
likes to target your past customers. It's a lot easier to hit a performance number, a ROAS target, by going after your past customers than it is to get net new customers. And given that uh, Google and Meta don't really have to tell you how many net new customers they have acquired for you, just that they're hitting their goals, we're finding that some of the campaign types are leading to significant slumps in net new customers, upwards of, and this is not uncommon, upwards of 67% drop in net new customers over the course of two to three years. So you need to find a way to pinpoint how many net new customers you have, what it used to be, what it is, set a target cost per acquisition, and we're gonna highlight how to do that. So we use a, a case study, uh, one of our clients, Solly Baby, uh, they sell baby wraps. Um, we just did a webinar with them two weeks ago. Uh, Nicole, the CEO, um, joined uh, Megan, her account manager and myself on a presentation. And one of the things we wanted to talk about was how uncovering net new customer trends and setting a goal really changed things. So early last year, um, we started to introduce Solly Baby to our, our customer lifetime value report, which tracks customer lifetime value on day one, how it matures over time, what the target cost per acquisition is. And the CEO of Solly Baby became one of our top power users of this report, number two power user out of all of our clients, and encouraged us into some really meaningful conversations. Those conversations helped us navigate towards uh, a framework that we've established that you need to understand the buying habits of your customer to be able to set meaningful targets on your net new customers. So first you need to study how a customer actually works after they've made a purchase and that helps you set your goal. So we broke things into three different camps. There are some businesses where your ultimate customer lifetime value happens really quickly. Virtually everything you're ever gonna get from this customer happened on that first sale. There's no repeat. And you can see it in the data, customer lifetime value versus first time purchase. They're pretty much the same. That's one category for businesses. The other extreme is um, like a uh, aviation business we manage. Every six months, customers drop about $500, 500, 500, 500 consistently every six months. That's high repeat potential. In fact, there's never a decay. We say, what is the customer lifetime value? Wow. 10 times the value of the first purchase. Okay, so that is a high repeat potential. But there's also a short repeat. And this happens a lot. People who are phaging into a particular need, for example. And that's what Sully Baby is. You know, you're, you're a mother, you need something for six months for your infant, but you don't need it again. And that's a short repeat window. When you know that, we come away with two observations. One, we always need new customers. Otherwise, six months from now, we're gonna have a slump. Every month, we've gotta get new customers to maintain our business in the long-term, short long-term. And we only have six months to either convert a customer or keep them and then they're gone. We used all that data to set target per target cost per acquisition goals and net new customer goals. And by just activating two months of focus on net new customers, we doubled the net new customers year over year. And we accepted we'd probably lose efficiency. Our cost per acquisition might skyrocket a little. It's a test, we'll figure it out. Instead, cost per acquisition actually dropped 15% because we put enough money into the right places that the learning engine started giving us discounts on cost per click and boosting our click-through rates, which happens when you've done things correctly. On the gorgeous side, when it comes to net new customers, um, we've put into place a tool that allows you to acquire those net new customers at a very efficient rate. If you think about 
first time customers coming to your website, about 92% of those first time customers will end up come shop around for a little bit of time and completely bounce off your website without ever making a purchase or engaging with your brand. So what if you could put into play a proactive chat campaign that encourages that shopper net you to your website to shop around for something that they might not even know that they needed? Maybe you provide them with an exclusive discount code. Maybe you provide them information on a product that you just released on their website, something super cool that they're not going to see anywhere else. A live chat proactive campaign can encourage shoppers to engage with you as a brand a lot more frequently. And if you think about live chat compared to uh, any other channel that you might have out there, you know, SMS or email, chat is actually one of the highest converting channels out there when you get customers to engage with them because you're providing them valuable pieces of information in a very quick period of time um, so that they can find the products that they need. They can potentially add more products to their cart. With Gorgeous Convert, you can also upsell them, right? If they add something to their cart, if they're viewing a particular product page, maybe you want to suggest a very personalized item to them based on their actions that they're taking on their website, on your website, I should say. So if these are first time shoppers and they're casually browsing around, you have the opportunity to capture them right away and turn them to a net new shopper. And then if you take that net new opportunity on the retention side, if they come back in the future, you immediately know about that customer what purchases they've made in the past, how much they've spent with your brand, uh, potentially how much they have in their cart, who they are in Shopify, if that's a platform that you're using. And you can run campaigns, proactive campaigns to shoppers on your website based on all of these different parameters. You can stack parameters on top of one another. And it gives you a really, really good opportunity, importantly on the net new side, but also on the retention side as a follow-up. That is really cool. Um, sorry, learning something new. Awesome. Okay. Moving ahead into our fourth uh, imperative, maximizing the value of first party data. Um, so kicking it off, why first party data? Simply put, uh, do you see brands just really need to lean more heavily on first and zero party data to drive engagement and acquisition because of the world we're living in? Um, it's a cookie-less ecosystem these days, especially with a lot of the changes Google made back in 2021. Uh, cost per acquisition is on the rise, especially with, you know, uh, meta ad costs increasing by like 150% over the last few years uh, and iOS updates just leading to stricter regulations around consumer privacy. Um, and when all of these changes first started happening, Yapo actually did a study and found that 82% of consumers are actually willing and want to share data with brands which I think really kind of breaks down a stigma that I've had for a while um, that people like don't want to give their information online, especially when I think about like my parents' generation. Um, so it's interesting to see that there's been this shift uh, in people actually wanting to give their information to brands so they can receive more personalized um, offers, communication, what, what have you. So from a marketer's perspective, it's increasingly clear that one of the most important evolutions in e-com is the ability or the um ability to understand for a brand what data you have what data you have the ability to to obtain from your customers and then the fun part how to organize it and ultimately like what to do with it all so at yapo we call it like the retention puzzle a lot of brands have all of the pieces and they don't know how to put it together or there's that one like pesky piece that at the very end you realize you're missing um, we've learned that 87% of marketers say their data is their most underutilized asset and 65% of them have said that they'd like to improve the way that they use their insights across all channels so that they can just better understand or better build uh, relationships with customers. So we know that the power, um, or we know the power that lies behind customer data, um, but the trick really lies in being able to translate it into action that truly moves the needle. So I know somebody, when I asked that question before about how many um, single point solutions you're using, somebody said too many. Uh, so part of the issue that brands today are using is or having is that they're using multiple platforms, too many tech partners or too many tools to gather insights about their shoppers um, because mainly like they're not speaking to each other um, when they have all of this data. So Something at Yapo that we're really focusing on uh, is solving for the scattered data issue. So we've expanded our extensibility efforts to really help brands collect and use more of this first and zero party data throughout the customer journey. 
So even going beyond just a lot of the tech integrations that we spoke about before, um, really being able to build uh, more accurate customer profiles, precise audience segmentation, personalized email and text for impactful experiences. So um, three recent data extensibility um, integrations that we've recently launched are with Aftership, Buy with Prime, which is a huge one because I shop on Amazon too much, uh, and Fairing. Um, Fairing is the example I actually wanted to showcase today, which is on this slide. Um, you can see here, if you don't know Fairing, they are a, a post-purchase survey provider. So really being able to get zero and first party data from customers at that moment post-purchase, which is of the highest engagement. Um, so to give an example, being able to ask a customer post-purchase um, for some information, maybe it's a skincare company and you're asking them what their skin concern might be. So let's say I filled out the survey and said, you know, my skin concern is dry skin. Yapo can now ingest that data. Um, so let's say there is a future campaign going out for a new moisturizer. I now know from that fairing data um, that Danielle is going to be a great target for that because she has dry skin. Uh, there's a new product coming out and maybe even really drive this home. She has loyalty points that she's able to redeem. So now we have all of the zero and first party data that we can use across our data extensibility and our product synergies to make an extremely personalized and meaningful, impactful message that we know is going to be extremely high converting because again, of all of the zero and first party data that's empowering it. Um, so those are just a few examples of the many data extensibility partners where ingestion of data through API is possible with Yapo. Um, and then to take this just one step further, close it out here. Um, we launched our retention dashboards last year, um, but now that we are able to really have this kind of like uh, CDP and, and retention dashboard to have a more holistic view of data in one place, um, we're now researching the idea of segmentation beyond any capability that we really have today with our new customer analysis dashboards. Um, so this really will give you the ability to identify customer personas for your store including either your best customers or those maybe likely to churn. Um, so you're able to quickly understand product preferences, engagement behavior, loyalty status, uh, and purchase trends. So you are able to find more similar customers to those different personas. And then you're able to get smarter insights into what actions they might take next on your site. So lots of good stuff to come over here, uh, leveraging all of that zero and first party data. Amazing. Yeah. And on the, on the gorgeous side, um, we're really big proponents of utilizing the data that you already have. Right. So we speak really, we speak really intently to the integration with the platform that you have in place. We'll take Shopify as an example. I'm sure there's a lot of Shopify brands in the room. Um, you can gather information, gather that data on your customers, uh, how much they spent with your brand before, how many orders they've placed, their shipping information, their tracking information, their order numbers, to be able to utilize that information in responses to customers, right? So you can pull in variables from your platform integration to utilize that data in responses to customers. You can turn on automations to make sure that they get those answers instantaneously without having to wait, especially if it's a very common repetitive question, like where is my answer? And then importantly on the back end of Gorgeous, what you're able to do is you're able to track your CX agents in terms of how much revenue they were able to generate through each individual channel over a very specific period of time. And utilizing that data through each of those channels to understand which agents have perhaps performed the best or which channels have performed the best with respect to interacting with your customers, generating sales, generating revenue, it allows you to use that data to then go ahead and inform future strategies around how you want to manage your customer support operations. You want to put more automation into place. You want to take a little bit out. You want to have humans available at the end of automation flows to be able to have them hop in to answer questions that might not be able to get answered. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different pieces of information that you can use based on customer support inquiries, based on data you already have in, in Shopify, based on data you already have through all of our different app integration partners like Yapo to be able to handle customers in the most efficient way possible. And so that's why, you know, Danielle spoke to Point Solutions earlier. That's why we emphasize the, the importance of having everything in one place, not having to flip back and forth between multiple different tabs, multiple different screens to copy and paste information to find different pieces of data uh, it keeps everything easy, it keeps everything efficient, and it keeps everything accurate. Awesome. Um, 
Hopefully you guys have already gotten some value out of this. We're going to close out with one more uh, imperative media mix modeling that we're going to share kind of our closing thoughts. Um, but media mix modeling at the core of it all is a solution to a lot of the problems that we're facing today. First of all, 10 years ago, there were only about six core channels that people would care about. SEO, Google Ads, conversion testing, email, Amazon, uh, Microsoft. Today, there's over 15, including TikTok, for example, that has over 1.5 billion daily users and wasn't around 10 years ago. Um, the channels themselves, like Google, are becoming much more complex. Um, they're no longer, Google is not just for search, it has YouTube, it has awareness, um, it has advocacy options. So a channel itself is made up of so many sub channels and ad types, getting the right mix is starting to get a little more difficult. There's a lot of biased wisdom out there. Someone who has had great experience with Meta will tell you, you must do Meta. You try it, it fails. Someone who swears by Google Shopping tells you to try it, it fails. There's no good paradigm right now that can steer you to the right channels, except for the one I'm going to cover in a moment. And there's also no marketplace wall anymore. You used to shop on Amazon or you were a website shopper. Pandemic came, Amazon decided not to sell a lot of products. People went online to websites, started to become website shoppers for the first time. Then Amazon made it easy for Meta, Google, uh, Critio, Bing to run ads, point it to Amazon so you can have people buy on Amazon or your website and actually keep track of that. Forget the fact that on top of all of that, all the attribution modeling and reporting is pretty garbage right now. It is impossible to compare one channel to the next. But the challenge for you is I want the right channel mix. I've got to do it right. I don't want to keep testing and testing and fail and do like failure-based optimizations. Tell me where to steer. I finally figured out a methodology that allows any business to determine where they should steer for high efficiency. And all that matters is you figure out, am I a search-based journey? or a brand-based journey. A search-based journey means that you cater to a category where there's always demand in that category. People know exactly what to call the category. They think the same way. It's like a known language. They think if I go search for this category, I'm gonna find options I might be open to. And then they start to get persuaded by images and videos and reviews, uh, price point, user-generated content, discounts, and they are focused on this categorical concept, this purchase, until they make the purchase. That's a search-based journey. All you have to do is dominate search. Show up when they first search, and you can win. A brand-based journey doesn't work quite the same way. People don't even know what to call the product. They don't know what to search for. Or they think it's important for me to buy from a brand that's going to keep my life preserved, like I'm buying a car, I'll only buy a brand I know, or your business caters to a very small business to business niche or something where you got to find a list of those people and then target them. Or it's a lifestyle category based on impulse. So you don't wait for someone to search for a t-shirt. You show them a t-shirt and they buy it. Question is, what do you think your business is? We're going to run a really quick poll here and see if you had to internalize these concepts. Do you think your business is a search-based journey? A brand-based journey? I will predict it's going to be 70% search-based because it typically is. We'll let the numbers populate. It closes out in five, four, three, two, one. So predicted 70% will be search-based, 67% are search-based, 24% brand-based. We split that extra 10, but we round out at 72 and 29. Um, so pretty much exactly what we would expect from our client base, from any webinar we do, uh, which is interesting to see how that works. All your brand-based journeys out there, focus on your meta and building awareness. 
all your search-based journeys. Do not give up any of your broad shoulders on your search keywords. So when you start to study these two paradigms, you understand that there are predictable patterns, there are must-dos. If you are a search-based journey, as roughly 72% of you are, you focus on consideration that's non-branded search, then a cocktail of ads taking the past visitor until they become a customer. That is your sweet spot. You must always build into that. If you want to give up some efficiency for more growth, you can do a little bit more in awareness, loyalty, and advocacy. <clears throat> you want a quick test? Look up in SEMrush the keywords you rank for and three of your competitors. See if a diamond forms in the Venn diagram overlap. Your search-based journey. You're all targeting the same keywords. Take all the brand names of your competitors, run them in a Google Trends for five years. Do you all rise and fall together? You are not generating demand, you are writing demand. You are a search-based journey. Get that done right first. Get the right investments. Then you can take investments that you've already been invested in and use statistics to figure out of all my investments compared to my revenue, how can I optimize my mix? Which of my channels in a search-based journey, it'll be like paid social is helping, but paid search is seven times more impactful on revenue. Product ads 12 times more. Which of my channels should I double down my investment in? How much can I increase my ad spend? Get your mix right, then optimize. Closing thoughts from each one of us and a quick poll. Closing thought, Danielle. We'll try to keep these quick so that we probably, like everyone's gonna leave in six minutes. So we'll uh, we'll make sure we get some of these questions out before that as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, closing thought, um, I think a shift in retention strategy, um, if brands are willing to make it, is going to pay off in the long run, um, especially those that are willing to get away from spray and pray and batch and blast mentality um, and take a step back and take a little bit more of a meaningful approach to who they're sending messages to. Um, we've seen that brands with the most significant revenue growth have seen a 100% increase in sales from repeat customers by focusing on optimizing two key levers, their customer lifetime value and their repeat purchase rate. Um, so if you focus on any two things and it's those, you're going to see significant revenue growth in 2024 and beyond. Um, so from everything you've learned today, uh, if our poll is, if you want to connect with Yapo about optimizing your retention strategy, pretty, pretty easy. Yes or no question. Um, I'll also throw in our, our benchmark for success and our goal is always to have at least 50% of your sales come from returning customers. So if you know that stat or that number off your top of your head and it's under 50, you might want to click A or yes. Awesome. We'll close this out in five, four, three, two, one. Oh, we got one more in there. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, you are up, Rob. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, so my closing thought uh, from the gorgeous perspective, optimize your utilization of automations and AI. Uh, they're very, very important topics. As I mentioned at the top of this presentation, if you don't focus on AI, if you don't focus on automation today, uh, you're definitely going to let get left in the dust uh, from a brand perspective, from a customer perspective. So make sure that you are looking into how you can optimize those pieces, put those pieces into place, get customers accurate answers as quickly as possible, as accurately as possible. Uh, and doing that will allow you to maintain a high customer satisfaction score, which at the end is going to keep them coming back for more. Uh, on the gorgeous side, um, what we're willing to do through our partnership with Agital and with Yapo as well, too, is to offer you all a CX audit. As I mentioned, gorgeous, we're built for e-commerce. We work with Shopify, BigCommerce, uh, Magento, WooCommerce. There's a question in the chat about custom. We can absolutely have that conversation. This, if you have some use cases there. Free, Rohan? This is a free CX audit. So what we're going to do in this process is we're going to analyze your company based on information that you input to us. And we're going to compare you to others in your industry, in your ecosystem to help you understand what you're doing from a customer support standpoint, what others are doing, and how we can ultimately help you get to an optimal uh, position with customer support. So that at the end of the day, 
you are driving revenue out of customer support. That's really our whole slogan at Gorgeous is turning customer support from a cost center into a revenue engine. Um, and so we can absolutely provide you with a free CX audit here. Uh, so hopefully get a lot of yeses for that. would love to be in touch after to provide you with that information. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to close this out in three, two, one. FYI, 92% of you just asked for a CX audit, which is so amazing. Um, closing thought from Agital, you've got to keep up with things like AI. That will keep you at par. Do not fall behind. But if you want to go further, it's all about the right channel mix, the right distribution across that VAC. That will allow you to grow so much easier. You'll be making more money from an efficiency standpoint while growing faster than your competitors because you're harnessing a virtuous cycle of growth. You're spinning your flywheel while others are just spinning their wheels. So I'm going to put out a poll here um, for a growth plan. Um, this is something I'll do with you personally. So anyone who says yes, I'm going to be up with you. I'm going to learn your business. I'm going to study your competitors. I do about a 50 point analysis across Google, Meta, SEO, TikTok, Pinterest, Amazon, email. Figure out where all your competitors are. If you're a search-based journey, a brand-based journey. And then I activate a few members of my team. If you have a lot of Google ad spend or Meta spend, we'll do complete audit audits on that side as well. At the end of it, for no cost, we will give you what we believe is the exact plan that you should follow to start unlocking your growth with more efficiency. And in most cases, we should be able to come in at a lower cost than your current agency. So uh, yes, maybe you have questions or no, I close this out in five, four, three, two, thank you. And let's get the questions. Do you guys see any questions that you have not already answered? I saw some answering going on. Danielle, you already answered one, right? Yeah, I, Ron and I both jumped in on some. I think we're caught up. Anybody have other questions? I'm down the road, totally new and two teams. Yeah, but so, uh, oh yeah, perfect. That was wrong. Any questions about AI, media mix modeling, first party data, any of the topics that we've covered today, happy to take you guys. That was a lot factor. Yeah, we work with regulated industries, sure. Yep. Yep, same on, same on our side for regulated industries. All good uh, for gorgeous. Yeah, we might just, have you yeah. guys approve, approve more three for three. of the content? Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, this is one of my favorite webinars this year. Thank you guys so much for your contributions. Um, it is nice to, to kind of stabilize your viewpoint going uh, deeper into this year on what's important or what's kind of new that you have to harness. Ron, Danielle, thank you guys so much. Ron, I think this is the first time you've joined our webinars. I've joined, I think, two of yours. Danielle, your second time up on this webinar series. I really hope that we can do more together, guys. This is fantastic. Thanks, Ben. Uh, oh, Thanks, Taylor, Matt. yeah. Everyone's going to get a copy of the presentation. Everyone's going to get a copy of the recording, even if you did not show up, but you signed up. And remember, if you know someone who wants to use any of our three businesses, send us a referral. You might not be the right person, but if you know someone, shoot them over, introduce us. We'd love that. That'd be great. All three of us. Thank you, folks. Thanks, all. Appreciate it.